you go to school, I imagine in China and Japan, you do not learn to use a steel pen and write a lot of letters unless you're learning Western tricks. You, you, you're drawing with a brush all the time. So he, took, he must have taken quite a lot of trouble with me, because I remember him telling me things like about curves and that curves always had a turning point, you know, because they aren't just a continuous curve, they come to a point when they give it on. It was the skills and freedom of style of Shoji Hamada that opened up a new dimension, both in work and friendship, for Bernard Leach. Though Leach was eight years the elder, the two became close friends, and it was together that they struggled to establish the St. Ives pottery, searching for the right clay and scouring the moors for wood for the kiln. When Hamada returned home, the East-West Bridge was at its strongest, for the pottery had been largely kept in business by Japanese friends who held exhibitions there on behalf of Leach, an act that he remembered 30 years later when he told the United Nations that Japan was a potter's heaven. He really lived with his, most of his life relating to Japan. Part of that's because he was having difficulties of not being appreciated here. The girl, when he came here in 1920, he was still in the... Um, what would you call the late stages of Victoriana? Gilt and blue and flowers, and here he was making these brown and tan things, you know. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really understood until... Only a very few collectors understood. But most of them who did understand had some sort of intellectual knowledge of the principles of art and taste from the Japan Japanese, you see, and they appreciated them. But he had uh, considerable difficulties. He used to ship a great number of his parts back to Japan for exhibition. Janet Leach, Bernard's third wife, is herself a potter trained in the leach Hamada tradition. But she has an American sculptural background and an immensely strong will of her own. As a result, Janet has maintained an individual style and it's a style that still has a Japanese market. 500 pounds for it. 500 pounds, 500, 600 now. 600 pounds, 700 anywhere, 700, 800. For some years, Leach rarely took pounds. more than two pounds a week from the pottery. At today's bustling auctions, fortunes are made and lost. And while Leach would surely have been flattered by some of the prices, others he might well have found amusing. 900 pounds, 1,000 anywhere. 900 pounds, 900. It's an unpredictable market. The guidelines are there, but when the catalogues are distributed, no one can be sure whether a pot will reach thousands or go back into store having failed to reach its reserve. Even the auctioneers are worried, and some openly advise would-be sellers to hold on to their leech pottery, for the moment at least. 1,400, 1,600, 1,800, 1,800, 2,000, 2,000, 200, 2,400. 2,600, 2,800, 3,000 pounds. One of the factors that caused the fall off in bidding was the appearance of fakes. The most sensational were from a prison workshop where the imitators were good enough to get past one of the country's leading valuers. What's 139? Stoneware vase. What's 139? Overall, the immediate value of a leech pot is now in doubt. It's still likely to fetch more than the work of any other 20th century potter, but the figure will be short of anything recorded 18 months or two years ago. The genuine art lover may pick up a bargain, but there's a feeling that it may be another two or three years before the professional dealers are back. 1,700, 1,800, 1,100, 1,000, 2,000, 100. At 2,000 it's here. The market first began to sag when the Japanese held back. And though that bridge between East and West is a little rickety at the moment, there are still many Japanese prepared to back their belief in Hamada and Leach with solid currency. Well, we're here today, obviously, to buy Hamada pottery or uh, Bernard Leach pottery, or combination if we could do so. We, in the end, ended up with a Bernard Leach piece, as you can see, nice piece. This is going to Japan, to Hiroshima, in fact. The idea is that the connection between Bernard Leach and Hamada the influence by Leach on, in fact, Japanese potters is very, very great indeed and is very much admired in Japan. 
this will be for a little while, I hope, in our family, going from generation to generation. The Japanese have very, very little furniture in the old houses. And they have one place where they display objects of art. And they only have maybe one or two objects displayed there. And this will be displayed in that place in Hiroshima, in the center of Hiroshima virtually. Few things would have pleased Bernard Leach more than to know that one of his works was to stand as a memorial in Hiroshima. He didn't talk much about his feelings for Japan in the war that led to the first atomic explosion, but it must have been a deep hurt to a man whose philosophy embraced all mankind. It was a philosophy that moved him to write poetry, and he became something of a mystic. His writings were often difficult to understand, but the pots spoke for him. Well, I think it's a huge part, the way I look at it. Uh, it's not Japanese, 100% Japanese, and it's not British either. It is something in between. That is, that's why I think that he's a very successful artist between my like, conjunction of East and West, because he's a brush stroke of drawings. It's very similar to the Japanese drawings, but yet it's not really Japanese. I think something he had very strong power of Western brushwork. So that is a totally, I think, new for the Japanese and new for the, I think, Western world too. That is, I think, an important part of his work. Many years ago, Leach first saw signs that Japanese craft pottery was in decline, the result, he thought, of imitating poor Western designs. So in the 1980s, do the ordinary Japanese know much about Leach, or even care? I think people involved with art, especially the art school, they are always remembered him, and he's highly qualified with that kind of section. But majority of people are very much, I think, forgot about him. Today, the Leech pottery at St. Ives is off the tourist track. He was well respected by his fellow artists and made a freeman of the borough. But if the local people remember much of him, they are somewhat reluctant to tell their tale. Leech, though, was proud to look upon himself as Cornish through his life and work and the blood link of his grandchildren. Well, we were a very united family, I think. And, uh, he loved his family. He absolutely loved games. And um, in the winter, in the summer, it was French cricket and uh, sardines. That was very popular. Uh, one fantastic occasion when uh, he was the one to hide and everybody was hunting and no progress made. But we did uh, every now and then hear squawk, a squawk coming from the side garden. So we realized that he must be in that vicinity. And we hunted uh, absolutely every shred of that garden. And well, as soon as we were there, there was no squawk anymore. <laughs> and eventually he had to give himself up. He'd been lying on a, on a horizontal branch of, a, of an old elder tree and more or less smothered in, in creeping ivy. But um, it was absolute marvelous camouflage. We, we never found him that time. And then in the winter, we had, um, what did we play? Um, paper games, up Jenkins. Uh, paper games like um, uh, Head, Bodies and Legs and that sort of thing. And up Jenkins was a great favorite game of his. I don't know if you know up Jenkins, but anyway. He was, uh, he was great fun uh, as uh, a playmate. More boyish in some ways than, than, than we were. But, um, I suppose he was, well, he was very interested in our, in our progress, very pleased if we did well. Uh, but I think always his work was more important than anything, even than his family. Work was first. I think the parents rather hoped that I might get into university. And I wasn't passing the exams, the necessary exams.